And good evening. Is Brittany Griner one step closer to coming home? That question tonight after she pleaded guilty to drug charges in Moscow. The WNBA superstar now facing a decade in prison after she told the Russian court today that she did bring cannabis into the country, but that it was unintentional. She's been detained in Russia since February after vape canisters were found in her luggage at a Moscow airport. President Biden telling Griner's wife he is working to secure her release after Griner penned an emotional letter to the president saying, quote, I'm terrified I might be here forever. There are growing calls to bring her home. Her team, the Phoenix Mercury, holding a public rally, fans and politicians joining her teammates and loved ones to show support from 6,000 miles away. NBC News Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent Andrea Mitchell is tracking this one for us tonight. On just the second day of her trial, WNBA superstar Brittany Griner, handcuffed and carrying a photo of her wife Sherelle, pleading guilty to charges of drug smuggling, four months after Russian authorities found vape cartridges containing cannabis oil in her luggage. She admitted that uh, it was uh, her, hers, but she said that it was unintentionally brought to, to Russia because she was in a, in a hurry as she was packing. The charge against the two-time Olympic gold medalist carries a possible 10-year prison sentence. Is there some hope that this could either shorten the sentence, get her some leniency, or even motivate them to begin negotiating? Seeing that there was a plea um, does make us hopeful that this process will continue to move forward. Friends are worried about how Griner would hold up. Locked in a Russian jail for weeks or even months more during a lengthy trial, ending in almost certain conviction. And today, the Russians said they wouldn't even talk about a prisoner swap until the trial is over. I think this was a strategy to speed up that process that can sometimes take in their system a long, long time. Uh, so that's the idea. After this is done, I think they're hoping for a swap. Possibly a trade for Russian arms dealer Victor Boot, a Putin favorite jailed in the U.S. Embassy officials were with Greiner in court today and delivered a letter from President Biden, a response to her emotional handwritten plea for his help. At home, the call's growing louder for the president to do more. I can't rest as her safety is in question. I honestly can't rest until she's home. Family, friends, and fans want her back. Andrea Mitchell joins us now from Washington. Andrea, when we spoke last night here on Top Story, you mentioned that other American currently jailed in Russia, Paul Whelan. I understand you have an update tonight. What's the latest there with his family? Well, indeed, I talked to his sister, Elizabeth, and she and their brother, David, are really concerned. They're feeling, frankly, that they don't have the celebrity, they don't have the resources of Brittany Griner, and that they're not getting the attention from the White House at all that, you know, that she's getting. He's been there four years, Tom, four years, and he's accused of spying, something that the U.S. and he strongly deny. It's just a trumped-up charge to get a hostage. And so they're really putting pressure on the White House. The White House said today they're in constant touch with the Whelan family regularly, at least once a week, but there's no offer for a presidential visit or call for them. For more on Brittany Griner's case and what possible negotiations for her release could look like, I want to bring in Dr. Danielle Gilbert, a Rosanna Fellow at Dartmouth College whose research covers hostage taking and recovery. So, Dr. Gilbert, tell me what you thought immediately when you heard that Griner had pleaded guilty. Thank you so much for having me. So the most important thing for us to know about this guilty plea is that it does not change the U.S. government's intention to bring her home. The State Department has designated Brittany Griner as wrongfully detained, and her guilty plea today doesn't change that. I can imagine a couple reasons why she might have entered that plea. She may have, as she said, unintentionally actually brought in 0.7 grams of hash oil, which would probably not even be a misdemeanor in the United States. Or she might have put in that plea to get better treatment at, in Russian prison, which is incredibly harsh place to be, especially for a black gay American, or it might be part of a deal to get her home. It might be a necessary requirement for a negotiated swap. So, so if there's a swap happening right now, who's speaking to whom? So, so the U.S., and, and is it somebody in the Biden administration? Is it somebody at the FBI, the CIA, the State Department? I mean, who's making those calls over to Russia to say, we want Brittany back, here's who we're going to give you? Sure. So there's two bodies that are currently working on negotiating her return. 
One is inside the U.S. government at the State Department. It's called the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs, who is essentially the United States government's chief hostage negotiator. He and his office are working behind the scenes in conjunction with the White House to negotiate with the Russians what that might look like. There's also some non-government personnel who are negotiating for her release. And former ambassador and former governor Bill Richardson and his organization, the Richardson Center, are also negotiating on her behalf. And they have worked on many former hostage and detainee cases with very successful results. Do you think this ultimately goes all the way to the Oval Office? Will President Biden make this call? I do. At the end of the day, when an American is coming home through any sort of prisoner swap or negotiated release, it's the president of the United States who has to sign off on that deal. What do you think is going to happen here? What's your prediction? So she will almost certainly be found guilty. More than 99 percent of cases in Russian court are found guilty. It is not a legitimate criminal justice system like we would think of in the United States. So she will almost certainly be found guilty, but that's just one step in the process. The Russians are working to increase their leverage, and then it really becomes part of the negotiation. At the end of the day, I would expect her and hopefully Paul Whelan to come home as part of a negotiated exchange. You think both of them in, in, in one exchange? I hope so. I mean, Paul Whelan has been in Russia since 2018. Brittany Griner has been there now for months. There was another American, Trevor Reed, who was captured in 2019 and was released just a couple of months ago. And I hope that all three of them will soon be together on U.S. soil uh, due to the efforts of the U.S. government to bring them all back. Okay, we hope you're right. It seems like Russia may lose some of its negotiating power if it sends two Americans back, but we're going to have to wait and see. Dr. Gilbert, we love having you on Top Story. Thank you. Now to our other major story tonight, U.K. Prime Minister Boris Johnson resigning today amid high-profile government resignations and mounting scandals, but he stayed in office until October. Here's Keir Simmons with the major political shakeup. Tonight, Britain, America's closest ally, descending into uncertainty after Prime Minister Boris Johnson's dramatic, defiant Downing Street statement today, blaming his own party for forcing him out. The herd instinct is powerful. When the herd moves, it moves. So how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world. But them's the brakes. And there we are, classic Boris Johnson. No apology, simply an explanation for why he fought so hard. As he spoke outside Downing Street, opponents booed. The world-famous Boris brand, unkept hair and love of political stunts, even when they went wrong. Boris, you're going to the other way. This way becoming a fatal liability as prime minister. His integrity questioned by a cascade of scandals where he was caught lying, including at first denying, then acknowledging he attended parties during COVID lockdowns. But his global impact undeniable, controversially leading Britain into Brexit and through a pandemic, even hospitalized himself, then allying himself with President Biden to support Ukraine's President Zelensky, traveling twice to Kiev. Thank you to your, your, your incredible, so your incredible saying, resistance. Yeah, yeah. Zelensky expressing sadness at Boris Johnson's departure today. All right, major international implications as well with this resignation. Keir Simmons joins us now from London. And Keir, Johnson plans on staying as prime minister un until October, yeah. but now there's some new controversy about that? That's right, there is, Tom. There are reports tonight that Boris Johnson hopes to hold a wedding party with his relatively uh, new wife, Carrie Johnson, at the world-famous Chequers country home of the Prime Minister, the place where, of course, Churchill famously held many parties. You've got to imagine that he isn't holding on to office just in order for that to happen. And certainly Downing Street, according to reports, is saying that he is well, staying in office for the good of the uh, country. But it's just a more controversy, as you say, even as he is leaving this famous office. And Keir, how does it work now replacing Johnson as prime minister? 
Well, it's very difficult to know who is going to be the next Prime Minister, Tom. I walked around this famous area, Westminster, in the shadow of the Houses of Parliament. I saw three senior members of government dropping into pubs for quick drinks with members of parliament to try and secure their votes. It is anyone's race. We do not know uh, who will win. And, of course, in the end, that means more uncertainty for the UK, with this crucial ally for the US, more uncertainty globally with so many difficulties, particularly, of course, in Ukraine. Tom? Back here at home to Highland Park, where the suspect's father is now speaking for the first time, defending his decision to help his son get a permit to buy a gun. This has more stories of acts of heroism from that horrible day emerge. Here's NBC's Maggie Vespa. Days after authorities say Robert Cremo III carefully planned an attack on a 4th of July parade, his father speaking out for the first time, telling the New York Post he talked to his son 13 hours before the shooting, adding, that's why I guess I'm in such shock. Like, did he have a psychiatric break or something? The father saying he sponsored his son's application for the ID card needed to buy guns because he thought he would use them at a shooting range. In the years since, prosecutors say Cremo bought five weapons, including the one used at Monday's shooting and another later found in his car. His father telling the Post his son bought everything on his own and they're registered to him, adding, I didn't do anything wrong. Tonight, officials are not ruling out the possibility that Cremo's father could face charges, though at this point, no determination has been made about his liability. <laughs> Meanwhile, this community is only beginning to process the trauma of Monday's attack. How are your officers doing? They're devastated. It's this is our community. Highland Park's are police and fire chiefs say many of their staff were in the parade. Kind of their families lined the sidewalks. We had a couple firefighters. They knew their families were right there where this shoot, shooting was happening. Uh, so they didn't know whether or not they'd pick up a family member. I didn't realize that the mother was also shot. Father and son Tom and Morgan Brooks were in an underground parking garage when the shooting started. They ran to help. Just in the plaza, just people lying down that were shot, a couple dead people. That's when they noticed something under one body. I saw two people. I saw two heads. So that's that's when it that's when it clicked in my head that it's there's someone else under him. He was very obviously a child. It was Kevin McCarthy lying on top of his two year old son, Aiden. Tom Brooks pulled the toddler out. He was saying shots, shots. And he would say mom shot, dad shot. And he just kept on saying that. He was saying mom shot, dad shot. He was. He kept on saying shots, shots. Kevin and his wife, Irina, among the seven who lost their lives that day. The Brookses say it was clear the dad died saving his son. He did what every father should do, and that's protecting his child. All right, Maggie Vespa joins us now live from Highland Park. Maggie, it is so hard to hear that one account, and there are so many stories out there from that, that awful day. I, I do want to go back to, to the alleged shooter in this case and the father who was speaking out. I understand that he also had a conversation sure. with his son just before the shootings happened the next day? He did. So in that conversation that he said uh, came 13 hours before the shooting, so down to the hour, he said he and his son actually talked about another mass shooting, one that happened recently in Denmark. And he said, in his words, the son called the Denmark shooter an idiot. And that's part of why he said he was so flabbergasted. And he gave those quotes to the New York Post saying, I don't essentially know what happened, wondering if he had, in his words, a psychotic break. And by the way, I do want to address kind of what's happening over to my left. You can probably hear the yelling in the background. It's been a calm, peaceful day. Tom, as you know, the scene is huge. You work here. It's still closed off. But we have had a couple of people, at least one person here now, show up kind of start to make this political a little bit. This person talking about how he's angry of coverage about the shooting and of conversations being had about it, mostly tied to politics. So definitely a still very chaotic scene and still just a lot of pain here. In yeah, and there's a lot of time. emotions and, and they're going to change by the day. All right, Maggie Vespa for us um, with a lot of new reporting tonight. Maggie, thank you. Now to Washington in the internal investigation just launched by the IRS. The probe coming after former FBI director James Comey and his deputy Andrew McCabe were subjected to a rare tax audit. Both men frequent targets of former President Donald Trump, raising questions about whether the audits were politically motivated. NBC's Maura Barrett has more. Tonight, the IRS launching a watchdog investigation after two of former President Trump's favorite punching bags found themselves under an incredibly rare IRS audit. 
According to the New York Times, both former FBI director James Comey and his deputy, Andrew McCabe, received letters from the tax agency informing them their tax returns were, quote, selected at random. Both men provided those audit notices to the paper. The odds of being chosen for such an intensive audit? Roughly one in 30,000. Comey received the letter in 2019, while McCabe learned of his audit in 2021. Both men drew the ire of the former president frequently. Comey's a liar and a leaker. You know, you know, I did you a great favor when I fired this guy. And McCabe and Comey, who lied to Congress and did so many other bad things. See, these are bad, corrupt people. These are bad people and very bad for our country. Trump even accusing both men of treason, a crime punishable by death in an exchange with our Peter Alexander. Who specifically are you accusing of treason? Well, I think a number of people, and I think what you look is that they have unsuccessfully tried to take down the wrong person. If you look at Comey, if you look at McCabe. Comey in 2018 didn't hold back his feelings about Trump either. I don't think he's medically unfit to be president. I think he's morally unfit to be president. Years of this dramatic discourse leading Comey to suggest Trump may have had something to do with the audits, telling the New York Times, maybe it's a coincidence or maybe somebody misused the IRS to get at a political enemy. Given the role Trump wants to continue to play in our country, we should know the answer to that question. McCabe coming to a similar conclusion on CNN Wednesday. Um, it just defies logic to think that there wasn't some other factor involved here. I think that's a reasonable question. When asked about the audit, former President Trump telling The Times through a representative, quote, I have no knowledge of this. An IRS spokesperson telling NBC News, it's ludicrous and untrue to suggest that senior IRS officials somehow targeted specific individuals for audits. The agency now referring the matter to the Treasury Inspector General for review. All right, Maura Barrett joins us now from Washington. Maura, this is either two things, a wild story or a wild coincidence. So while we wait for the results of that review, do we know how the audits turned out? Yeah, Tom, the audits have been completed. The first one from 2017 reportedly found that Comey and his wife actually overpaid. They told The Times that they received almost a $350 refund. Meanwhile, McCabe and his wife told The Times that they actually owed a little bit extra, a small sum, they say, that they paid back. Okay, Tom. has the Biden administration said anything about this today? Well, Press Secretary Corrine Jean-Pierre did answer a question about whether the president has confidence in the IRS commissioner, who was a Trump appointee. She refused to answer directly and said, saying repeatedly, uh, that his term is up in November. All right, Maura Barrett for us tonight. Maura, thank you. We turn now to the growing concern over rising COVID cases again and the number of infections that may be undercounted. Omicron's highly contagious subvariant BA5 now responsible for the majority of new cases. Will new vaccines prevent what could be a devastating new surge? Miguel Almaguer has more. Tonight, as Americans gather, travel, and vacation in record pre-pandemic numbers, the U.S. may be quietly and rapidly moving towards a summer COVID surge. There's no question in my mind that we're missing a vast majority of infections right now. Omicron subvariant BA5, the most contagious version of the virus yet, now dominant, making up more than 50% of new cases. And while there is no alarm at hospitals nationwide, many public COVID testing sites have shuttered, while at the same time, results from at home test kits are going unreported. The truth is, there are probably several hundred thousand, four or five hundred thousand infections a day happening across the country. Americans previously infected or protected by a vaccine are catching the virus at a worrisome rate. Even the boosted have gotten sick multiple times. We are seeing a lot of reinfections within months of prior infections. It's a reminder that an infection does not give you lifelong immunity. It's also a reminder that we're seeing rapid evolution of a virus that's trying to escape that prior infection immunity. With testing underway for a multi-pronged umbrella vaccine aimed at stopping future mutations, this fall the U.S. is expected to roll out a booster targeting Omicron. Are you concerned at all that the new vaccines won't be able to protect Americans in the fall? So I remain optimistic 
that whatever, however the virus evolves, the new vaccines will provide a greater degree of protection, certainly than the vaccines we have right now. While a new poll says a majority of Americans are back to their pre-pandemic lives, tonight around 60 percent of the nation has already caught COVID, a number certain to climb. As COVID cases climb in pockets of the country, in many areas there's been talk of returning to mask mandates indoors, but there simply isn't a public appetite for that safety measure. Tom. All right, Miguel. Today, the clinic at the center of the Supreme Court case overturning Roe versus Wade closed its doors. This added Mississippi to the list of states where abortion is no longer available. Blaine Alexander is in Jackson tonight. At Mississippi's only abortion clinic, as of today, the abortions are no more. Physicians like Dr. Cheryl Hamlin are seeing their last patients for follow up visits before the clinic permanently closes tonight. Has this been an emotional time for staff? Yeah, yeah, a lot of hugging, yeah. Mississippi is now one of nine states banning nearly all abortions. Three other states have implemented six-week bans with rare exceptions. For women across the South who may be seeking abortions, what do you want these women to know? So I want these women to know that the pro-life movement is very compassionate, genuinely so, um, and wanting to walk with them in their time of need getting them the resources that they need. The changing landscape of laws is putting increased focus on the states that do allow the procedure. Soon, the Pink House, as it's known in Mississippi, will reopen in New Mexico. They are starting a fund to help women from Mississippi and beyond get there. I, I'm not going to abandon these women. I mean, there's limits to what I can do, but I'm not going to abandon them. In North Dakota, Tammy Kromenacher is also preparing for a move. She runs Red River Women's Clinic, which today sued to stop that state's trigger law set to take effect at the end of the month. Um, gives us some more time. She is moving the clinic from Fargo, North Dakota to Moorhead, Minnesota, just 15 minutes away, but still a tremendous undertaking. Um, this is not just simply, you know, packing up a house or an apartment and moving, you know, across the city. This is learning new rules and regulations, making new forms for a new state, making sure that we are in compliance um, with the new state rules and, and restrictions. And Tom, this now shuttered clinic joins a growing list with more possibly on the way. Right now, at least 10 states have bans or restrictions either in litigation or set to take effect in the coming weeks. Tom. OK, Blaine, we thank you. We're tracking also severe weather tonight. The upper Midwest to the southeast on alert for torrential rain and powerful winds. Widespread damage in the Cincinnati area, Cincinnati area we should say, after two confirmed tornadoes touched down there. Nearly 20,000 customers still without power. And in California, evacuation orders outside of Sacramento as a wildfire threatens hundreds of homes. Much of the country also facing dangerous heat. So let's bring in meteorologist Bill Karens, who joins us now. So, Bill, walk us through the next couple of days. Yeah, good evening, Tom. Uh, the severe weather today has not been as rough as it was the last two days. We still have some areas of concern, and one of them being Augusta, Georgia. They just got nailed by a really powerful thunderstorm. Severe thunderstorm warning for there. We got some severe thunderstorm warnings just south of Charlotte and also just south of Raleigh. But they're not widespread, and we're mostly seeing some wind damage with these storms. We're not seeing any tornadoes today, and we haven't really seen many reports of large hail. So let me take you through tomorrow, because we only have a small area of concern. We have two of them, one in Montana, and then as we head towards the Louisville, Cincinnati area, and also around Goshen, Ohio, where we just showed you that damage from that tornado, that EF2 that hit uh, last night. That area could also see more severe weather. Seven million people at risk, so a small area, but this area has been hit hard the last couple of days. I think this uh, heat story is going to be the weather story as we head into the weekend. Temperatures right now at this hour still feels like 108 from Little Rock to Memphis. Notice Savannah, Georgia, you cooled off as some thunderstorms rolled through, so you were one of the lucky ones, but Dallas and Shreveport still very very toasty right through this evening. So for tonight into tomorrow, we've lost some of our heat advisories in the areas of the Carolinas, so that's good. But we still have excessive heat warnings from Memphis to Little Rock, Tupelo to Nashville. Dallas is now under an excessive heat warning. This is going to be a very hot stretch of weather. So for tomorrow, Dallas is 105. And then as we head into the weekend, we do 105 again. And as I mentioned, there's just not a lot of relief, Tom. We are going to stay very hot in the middle of the country, and the drought situation continues to get worse. And now we're starting to worry about some of the crops uh, before they get collected in the fall. A lot of them are struggling in this heat and through the drought.
Going to be so hot there in San Antonio. Okay, Bill, we thank you. Still ahead tonight, the new details on the woman suspected of killing an elite cyclist. Authorities revealing her movements during her month on the run, including multiple aliases and the paper trail that finally helped track her down. Plus the driver trapped inside a submerged SUV. Look at that. How a group of good Samaritans and first responders saved her life. And the shocking moment a man jumped out of a New York City subway platform to escape police. What happened next? Stay with us. All right, welcome back. We want to take you to Texas, where tonight U.S. Marshals are revealing new information about that yoga instructor turned fugitive in the case of that murdered cyclist. Not only was she using multiple aliases, but officials say she had multiple passports and even a receipt for plastic surgery. NBC Sam Brock is there tonight. Tonight, we're learning more about how Caitlin Armstrong was brought into custody following a 43-day-long search as the prime suspect in the murder of Anna Mariah Wilson, a world-class cyclist. No matter where crime is committed, no matter where you flee, you're not beyond the reach of the law. The state, federal, and international nexus began with a warrant for Armstrong's arrest on May 17th in Austin. A flight fleeing the country using someone else's real passport from Newark, New Jersey on May 18th per U.S. Marshals. And then a capture when Costa Rican authorities nabbed the 34-year-old on June 29th at a hostel in Santa Teresa Beach. We concentrated where she took a bus from the San Jose airport in Costa Rica uh, to hours away. Uh, they knew the route of that bus, and so that's where they started boots on the ground, and I'm telling you, it was old-fashioned police work. The gumshoe approach, uncovering Armstrong using at least three different aliases. She altered her appearance, at the very least, by dying and cutting her once curly blonde hair. Marshall say Armstrong also sported a bandage on her nose and bruising when found. Do you have any reason to believe that she had plastic surgery to try to alter her appearance? She had a bandage on her nose uh, with a little bit of discoloration under her eyes. You know, her statement was that it came from a surfboard incident, and I think it's just, we'll leave it at that. Officials adding Armstrong left behind a receipt and two passports in a safe. What did the receipt show? Uh, the receipt showed some type of uh, surgery, plastic surgery. Uh, to her nose? Uh, I don't know if it was specifically to the, to the nose area. I just know it was in the value, I believe, above $6,000. The suspect now faces a first-degree murder charge with the wealth of circumstantial evidence linking her to the crime. A police affidavit describes her 2012 Jeep spotted on surveillance video next to the house where Wilson was found shot and murdered. Her boyfriend, Colin Strickland's acknowledgement to police that he recently purchased Armstrong a gun and an anonymous caller telling detectives when Armstrong discovered Wilson had a romantic relationship with Strickland, she, quote, became furious and was shaking in anger. She told detectives in that same conversation, Armstrong wanted to kill Wilson. The suspect's attorneys have declined comments, asking for privacy. A judge will instruct a jury about consciousness of guilt and that, that those pieces of evidence serve as consciousness of her guilt and it can be used against her. Now, the months-old march to find the person accused of robbing a young woman of a promising life. I don't think anyone would have anything bad to say about her officially goes to court all right sam brock joins us now live from austin tonight sam it sounds like armstrong was all over the map how did they even trace her to the airport in the first place this was a labyrinth, Tom, trying to find Caitlin Armstrong. U.S. Marshals were interviewing someone who ended up becoming a confidential source. That person tipped them off to the fact that she was dropped off at Newark. But how were they going to find her? Because remember, Caitlin Armstrong was using a real passport that belonged to somebody else. So what they did is called a wild card search in putting associates of Armstrong into a giant database. And somehow one of them popped up, although, of course, it was actually Armstrong. So they have this name. But now what do you do? Investigators also discovering that there there are thousands, literally, of blonde young women going to Costa Rica to become yoga instructors. However, Tom, the Costa Rican officials tracked the bus that she was taking to Haco, then went from there to Santa Teresa, and that's where they went knocking on doors and ultimately found Caitlin Armstrong. Tom? Wow, what an incredible manhunt, woman hunt, but they were able to track her down. Sam Brock, <laughs> thank you for, that, for those details. Now to a dramatic rescue. Deputies, firefighters, and witnesses in Florida all rushing to save a driver who was trapped in a vehicle. She had veered off the road, and her upside-down SUV was filling with water. NBC Stephen Romo takes us through the intense moments captured by police body cam. Tonight. What's the emergency, ma'am? 
Um, there is a vehicle upside down in the ditch, and I do not know if anyone is in the vehicle. Some quick thinking by a few good Samaritans leading to a rescue in Volusia County, Florida, northeast of Orlando. After an SUV veered off the road and overturned in a water-filled ditch on Tuesday, first responders arriving on scene eight minutes after the first 911 call came in. We saw a car upside down ditch. Is it upside down? Then working together with witnesses to turn the half-submerged car over. Yeah, there's somebody in there. Can, can we get this thing flipped or not? The driver stuck inside and unconscious. We need some help pushing. <laughs> Police released this edited body cam footage showing the moments the SUV was finally flipped. Hey, give me a knife. Officials cutting the airbags and then later lifting the woman out of the driver's side window and onto a backboard. Then out of the water where first responders performed life-saving measures. The sheriff's department says she still had a pulse. The woman, whose identity is still unknown, was transported to a nearby hospital where she remains in critical condition as of Thursday afternoon, according to authorities. But first responders and neighbors stepping up to give her a fighting chance. Stephen Romo, NBC News. All right, when we come back, Trump's endorsement power put to the test as he campaigns alongside Republican candidates in key battleground states and his latest push for Sarah Palin. Von Hilliard in the House, live in studio tonight. He's been watching those races closely and is breaking down how much weight the former president still holds on the GOP. Stay with us. All right, we are back now with Top Story's news feed, and Derek Chauvin has been sentenced to another two decades behind bars. Last month, the former Minneapolis police officer pleaded guilty to violating George Floyd's civil rights, a federal judge sentencing him to 20 years with time served. Chauvin is already serving a 22-year prison sentence for Floyd's murder. A suspect fleeing police in New York City took his getaway to New Heights. You gotta check out this video. It shows the 25 year old man jumping from an elevated subway track and onto a building's roof in Brooklyn. A crowd below was cheering for him. Police say he climbed up the pole after hitting an NYPD officer with his car door while fleeing a traffic stop, but he did not make it far. He injured his legs and police took him into custody. Now to the latest convictions in the Theranos scandal, a California jury finding the company's former president, Sonny Balwani, guilty of defrauding investors and patient. The now defunct company he ran with ex-girlfriend Elizabeth Holmes falsely claimed their technology could use very small blood samples to test for a variety of illnesses. Holmes was convicted on similar charges in January. All right, we turn now to power and politics with former President Trump trying to show his influence on the Republican Party with endorsements in key primary battleground states. He's also going to campaign for Sarah Palin in her run for Congress. This has investigations into the former president heat up. Vaughn Hilliard has the latest. Multiple investigations into former President Trump intensifying this week, but it's not stopping him from wading into proxy battles across the country for control of the Republican Party. Endorsed by President Trump, Carrie Lake for governor. In Arizona, Trump's candidate, Carrie Lake, in a heated GOP primary matchup against Karen Taylor Robeson. She was endorsed on Thursday by current Arizona Republican Governor Doug Ducey. It was Ducey who screened Trump's call while certifying Trump's 2020 election election loss in the state. There's only one great candidate for governor this year, Karen Taylor Robeson, and I'm proud to support her. This after a fiery debate between the candidates. Mamma mia. We I feel like state. I'm on an SNL skit here. The growing rift in the party as Trump prepares to head out on the campaign trail this weekend to Nevada for a rally, helping lift his pick for the U.S. Senate there, Adam Laxalt, who will take on incumbent Democrat Catherine Cortez Masto in November, and then to Alaska to support Sarah Palin, who is running for Congress, returning a favor from six years ago when she campaigned for him in Iowa. Are you ready to make America great again? <laughs> and Kelly Chewbacca. The, the woke, woke leftist tried, tried to cancel, cancel me. me. Who Trump is hoping will oust the state's current Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski, who voted to convict the former president after his impeachment for January 6th. Lisa Murkowski, someone who's supposed to fight for Alaska, 
Stop fighting for us years ago. This after Wednesday night's Republican debate for Michigan governor, where each of the candidates tried to outprove their loyalties to Trump in the state he lost in 2020. Yes, I was in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. President Trump is still my president. These Republican races as the January 6th Select Committee continues its investigation. Its next public hearing is Tuesday, and a district attorney in Atlanta, in an interview with NBC News' Blaine Alexander, not ruling out a subpoena for the former president regarding potential interference in the 2020 election. We're going to do our due diligence. Plus, just over one week from now, over the course of the investigation, Trump is slated to be deposed by lawyers from the New York State's Attorney General's Office as part of its civil investigation investigation into the Trump organization and its assets. For Trump, a continued battle on two fronts, against persistent probes and for pure political power. All right, Vaughn Hillier joins us now in studio. So, Vaughn, I guess the question is, we're still in the primary season in some of these states. Are those investigations having any impact on the way the former president is playing politics right now? No, he's going to Nevada tomorrow, Alaska on Saturday. That's why this is twofold here. Yeah. While all of these investigations are going on, we're going to be watching two more hearings next week, as well as him sitting for a deposition with the New York Attorney General's office next weekend. He's out there looking at political power, not only engaging in these Republican primaries, trying to build that state stable of loyalists in Congress in 2023, 2024, but also ultimately, you know, if Republicans in November are able to take the majorities in the Senate and in the House, that would likely quash any investigations into him or his allies. So there is incentive for him for Republicans to do well this November in these races coming up, because ultimately uh, there's a lot of question marks about where these investigations could potentially go. Right. And I do want to ask you briefly about Arizona, because it was interesting what you showed there in your report, that debate for the governor's race, the Republican primary there. It feels like President Trump is almost on the ballot there. What's your sense of who wins that race? You know, I've been talking to a lot of Republicans, those who even worked with the former president's campaign there in 2020, and they said it's so unclear where the electorate is. You know, polling has been up in the air the last couple of years. But ultimately, when we're looking at some of these primaries, who makes up the Republican electorate these yeah. days? And can somebody in a place like this, can somebody who is a Trump acolyte pull off a win against somebody who is more aligned with a traditional conservative like Karen Taylor Robeson, who just received that Doug Ducey endorsement here today? Right. All right. Vaughn Hilliard for us. We really appreciate that. We want to turn on to Money Talks, what consumers and investors need to know from the business world and beyond. The wholesale price of gas is coming down. But... When will Americans see relief at the pump? U.S. gasoline futures dropping more than 11 percent this week, following a decrease in oil prices, but with the national average for a gallon of gas around $4.75 still. I want to bring in the founder of the Energy Word and author of Turning Oil Green, Dan Dicker. He joins Top Story once again. Dan, great to have you on Top Story tonight. So my question to you is this, and the whole genesis of this segment is, people out there are reporting that, that gas retailers, essentially gas stations, are now buying wholesale gas for a cheaper price, and they're still sticking it to the consumer. Of course, they have to make a profit, but, but are the profits now too high even for the gas stations? Well, you know, the rack price changes, Tom. What really is interesting about what's going on is that, you know, the gas market and the crude oil market are as strange as I've ever seen them. Uh, it's another piece of what's been a very strange couple of years everywhere you look. Um, and gas prices are really tethered more to the demand for gasoline here in this country. And what the real issue is with gas prices, the reason they won't come down as much as crude oil has come down in recent days is because drivers, for all their whining about gas prices, and it's honest whining, it's very, very expensive, refuse to drive less. We, we, the miles driven that we're looking at are as high as they've ever been in the entire history of this country. Now, we know that there's a lot of pent up demand because people want to travel after the pandemic. And But, but uh, do you see, is, do you know, see major... stuff out there? I get that. But do you see stuff out there of, of gas stations, price gouging? And listen, I know we live in America and businesses should be able to make a profit. But, but where's the line being drawn? Or is there a line? I, I tell you that I haven't seen much of this. And the reason is that there is a generalized rack price, okay? And that's what you're talking about, this kind of uh, wholesale price for guessing that goes to everybody, whether it's to Exxon stations or Shell stations, Gulf stations, or your local Speedway, your local BJ's club. Costco, and wherever you get your gas, yeah. Yeah, and the point is that, you know, people who are shopping for gasoline won't find much of a difference between the BJ's Club, who has no interest whatever in, in putting much of a profit from their wholesale price to their consumers for a very good reason, and what they're paying at Exxon. You can save a few cents 
but I do not see this kind of widespread gouging that people are talking about, and it really doesn't exist in the marketplace. It so, really does. So the prices don't come down, you don't think, until Americans start driving less? Unfortunately, I mean, that's economics 101. I mean, prices have to match demand at some point, and so far, um, the demand has not been coming down based upon the prices. So uh, I think we're going to get some relief. I, I think that there is finally some interest in driving less and carpooling, doing all of those things in the summertime that you need to do in order to uh, relieve yourself of what high gas prices are. But until we see the, the kind of the, um, the behaviors of American drivers change a little bit, uh, I think we're in for a, a tough summer in terms Dan, of gas prices. Dan, before you go with the change in price of oil, do you think this changes anything in the president's calculation as he heads to Saudi Arabia? Uh, you know, in many ways, the president is doing what every president has done when prices have gone up. George Bush went to Saudi Arabia. Trump sent, a, you know, an emissary to Saudi Arabia when prices went up. And what he's going to do, he's going to ask for more barrels from the Saudis. The Saudis are going to pat him on the head like he's patted, the, like the, the, the sheiks have patted uh, other presidents in the past. And they're going to tell him, we're doing all we can do, Mr. President. Please be patient. And basically, they're going to do nothing. So uh, it's very much... You know, it's very much in the interest of the president to try and do something and to uh, appeal to what is supposed to be a military ally in the United States to help him out in terms of uh, oil prices and gas prices. But I don't think he's going to get very far. Dan Digger for us. We always love you breaking down the complicated and frustrating issue of gas prices in this country. All right, we move on now to Top Stories Global Watch. ISIS has claimed responsibility for a deadly prison raid in Nigeria. The attack in the capital of Abuja freed nearly 900 inmates. More than 440 are still missing, though. Several people killed, including a security officer. The claim from ISIS raising fears that the terror group, which has close ties to Boko Haram, is moving from the northeast part of that country. All right, and Spain's running of the bulls has returned after three years. Thousands running through the streets of Pamplona, chased by bulls, to mark the start of a nine-day festival. That festival was last held in 2019 due to the pandemic, of course. At least six people were injured this year, including a man from Atlanta, but they are all expected to be okay. All right, coming up, the unrest in Haiti, violence reaching unprecedented levels in the country one year after the shocking assassination of its president. So is it impacting immigration in the U.S.? Gabe Gutierrez standing by. Back now with the Americas. Today marks one year since President Jovenel Moise was assassinated in his home, and the turmoil in Haiti is growing worse by the day. Gang violence and fuel shortages are just some of the problems plaguing the people of that country, and many see no end in sight. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez reports. Today in Haiti, a memorial marking one year since President Jovenel Moise was assassinated. Protesters demanding answers. It comes as the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights says armed violence has reached unimaginable and intolerable levels in Haiti. Last month, a gang took over the country's largest port and set files on fire. This has become daily life here in Haiti. Tires burning on city streets, protesters furious at the government's inability to confront kidnappers. Since we reported from Port-au-Prince last year following the kidnapping of 17 missionaries, the desperation in Haiti has grown more dire. <laughs> Fuel shortages, gang violence, labor strikes. In some parts of the country, all-out lawlessness. The director of this hospital told us medical personnel live in fear of being abducted. They're very scared, and we are trying to provide some training about anticipating some, some alert signs to avoid. From January to March of this year, there were 225 reported kidnappings in Haiti, a 58 percent jump from the same period last year. In April and May, the U.N. says 16,000 people have been displaced and 1,700 schools have been forced to shut down, leaving half a million children out of their classrooms. As for investigations into Moise's assassination, there have been few clear answers. The U.S. Justice Department alleges that a group of about 20 Colombian nationals and a group of Haitian Americans participated in the plot that was initially focused on kidnapping Moise, but ultimately ended up killing him. 
In Haiti, 18 jailed suspects, ex-Colombian soldiers, have not stood trial yet. La justice doit continuer à faire le maximum pour traquer les coupables. Another suspect, Prime Minister Ariel Henry himself. The New York Times reporting that phone records indicate he spoke with another man accused of masterminding the plot. Henry has denied wrongdoing. The Justice Department has asked a Miami court to stop testimony from one of the extradited suspects from being made public because it may contain classified information. All right, Gabe Gutierrez joins us now on set. And Gabe, I know NBC News has some additional new reporting about the immigration crisis with Haiti and the U.S. right now and a change in policy. Yeah, that's right, Tom. According to an internal planning document obtained by NBC News, the Biden administration is allowing more Haitians to stay in the U.S. and seek asylum if they come through a legal port of entry. Now, previously, you might remember, Tom, many Haitians were being flown back to Haiti uh, if they came to the U.S., but now the Biden administration is trying to incentivize Incentivize those Haitians to go through a legal port of entry instead of trying to cross undetected. We thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.